Hi, everyone. I'm David Tzvi Kalman, and I'm the producer for Identity Crisis. We're currently taking a summer hiatus, but we wanted to make sure that you don't forget about us. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be rebroadcasting some of our most popular episodes from the last year. We'll be back in September with all new episodes. This week, we're bringing you a conversation between Yehuda Kurtzer, Miriam Anzavin, and myself on the topic of sharing Torah on new platforms like TikTok. Anzavin's videos, which are very short, very irreverent, and all about the Talmud, caught the attention of both American and Israeli Jews in a way that I'd really never seen before. We talked about the videos, the backlash, and what it means to talk about Jewish ideas in the 21st century. Anyway, enjoy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Identity Crisis, a show about news and ideas from the Shalom Hartman Institute. I'm Yehuda Kurtzer, president of Shalom Hartman Institute North America. This episode contains a little bit of explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. So what exactly is this thing that we call Torah that so many of us Jews seem so obsessed with? Torah is a delightful word, actually. It's a noun derived from the verb to instruct or to teach. But it's much more than the object that is a Torah, like a Torah scroll. Torah is supposed to encompass all of the stuff that we care about, the knowledge that defines Judaism, and that exists both in fixed forms, in canons and in books and in stories and interpretations. And it exists through knowledge that is still yet to emerge, that can only come into the world through our absorbing what already exists and then formulating new Torah for our time. Torah is, as our tradition says, our life and the length of our days. Now, traditionally, Torah comes in two well-known forms. There's the written Torah, the old five books, and then there's the really proprietary piece of Judaism as it differentiated itself in antiquity and evolved over time what we know as Torah Shabal Peh, the oral Torah, or perhaps the Torah in the mouth. Come back to that, mouth Torah. In the New Testament and in Josephus, in trying to characterize or describe the people who became the predecessors, our ancient rabbis, they used the Greek word paradosis, which means they were the people who were kind of fixated on tradition, a gift, something that was passed down from one generation to the other. That term kind of sounds right to me and rings familiar because tradition is not just another set of books, those things we know as Talmud and Midrash that emerged orally and then took fixed forms. The oral Torah is a habit of mind and heart, a practice that takes responsibility to inherit stuff that's transmitted to us and then give it over to the next generation with our modifications and our edits along the way. The most famous oral tradition text that we have, I think, is the first Mishnah of the Tractate of Avot. Moshe receives the Torah from Sinai and then transmits it to Joshua. Do you notice the change in verbs? To receive something is not the same as to transmit it. In that moment, between the time where you get it and the time where you give it to someone else is where innovation kicks in. The process of trying to figure out how to convey wisdom to others, and in the process, it becomes a different wisdom than the one that you received. As a teacher of Torah professionally, and I think also as a parent, I think about this all the time. What am I inheriting and what am I transmitting? This way of thinking, being part of an oral tradition over time, I think it both keeps us humble because you're not always supposed to be an inventor. Sometimes the most important thing we do is to preserve the past, things that are greater than us that are supposed to outlive us. But it also makes us feel responsible to lay the foundation for what comes next. So oral Torah, the Torah of the mouth. For a long time, Jews have been both scared of losing this chain of Torah and also scared of codifying it or calcifying it in fear that it will lose its life force. We get anxious today as Jews when not enough people know enough Torah. And then we also get anxious that the way to get more Jews to know Torah, the things that you'd have to do to popularize it, will turn something from sacred to profane. Enter Miriam Anzavin. Miriam is an artist who works professionally as a content creator for JewishBoston.com, and she's also just a person with a gift for making TikTok videos. And Miriam took to TikTok to start chronicling her journey through Daf Yomi, the practice of studying a page of Talmud every day for seven years. A couple of weeks ago, Miriam achieved that ambivalent status moment for internet content creators of going viral. I say ambivalent because I think that's what generally content creators want. And then at the same time, everyone has an opinion about you and about what you're doing. There's no version of my describing Miriam's videos that will help you understand them. Um, We're not going to play a clip of them because they don't really make sense merely as audio pieces. So please go watch them or find a teenager who can send it to you. 
The videos are learned and subversive at the same time. With summaries of the main ideas of the page of Talmud, they're all quite short, even though Talmud pages are long and complicated, but they are delivered with periodic profanity, the use of a lot of contemporary online idioms, and they are gussied up with high quality production values. Since one of those videos went viral, so did Miriam, and her approach to teaching Talmud generated multiple thought pieces, as usually happens in the Jewish world, including one from our producer, my colleague, Dr. David Svi Kalman, as well as a feature on Israeli television introducing Miriam to Israeli audiences. So Miriam and David Svi join us today to talk about Torah, the new modes that it needs, what it means to teach Talmud on TikTok, what are the boundaries of legitimacy around Torah, and what the future of Torah study will look and sound like. So... Miriam, thanks for being on the show. And just before we get into the bigger philosophical questions that I want to talk about, just tell us a little bit about what the last couple of weeks have looked like, because I'm sure going from a kind of niche Talmud teacher on TikTok, maybe doing this for yourself, to actually like a kind of household name among people who are talking about Talmud must have been a little bit strange for you. Yes. Thank you, first of all, to both of you for having me on the podcast today. I'm really excited to be here and talk to you about this, indeed, completely surreal experience. I will say that at the beginning of December, I started creating these TikToks. I was doing the DAF anyway. I'm going to be doing it for another five years as well. And I figured, you know, TikTok is such an interesting place. You get to learn all types of things and see content from all different types of people. Maybe there's a niche for Dafiomi TikToks among people of my own generation who might be thinking about it and speaking in the same way that I do. And I'll say that what's in my videos is very much how I communicate with uh, my study partner. This is how we uh, converse about the day's Daf. So I started it. And like you noted, uh, you know, it's small niche audience for this until my Moet Katan 9 video, which perhaps was the most impassioned, shall we say, of all the DAFs at that point. And overnight, it seemed like all of Israel was messaging me. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I was like, wait, how do you guys know? How do you guys know about me? And I discovered that I had gone viral in Israel. And suddenly I had so many messages in my inbox from news agencies and television personalities and podcasts and websites and all types of things, synagogues around the world, not even just America or Israel, who wanted to talk to me about this, what I was doing, or to say, hey, can you come and talk about your approach and talk about Talma to our audience or group? And to be honest, even though that video went viral two weeks ago, to this day, I'm still sorting through the notifications and contacts. I think that day, there was a confluence of things that happened. First, I did an accidentally viral tweet in that morning where I said I existed at the intersection of Safaria and Sephora. And that really resonated with hmm, a lot of people. Worked, yeah. The forward article about me dropped. That was the first article about me dropped. And that video, Moed Katan 9, dropped that same day. So it has been absolutely a whirlwind to have suddenly become not just one human being, but an idea, uh, more of a concept really than a person that people are speaking about in the mode that you would speak about a famous person. And to me, this is truly mind boggling. Yeah. So I'm sitting here and I'm listening to this intro and I'm just laughing because it's so surreal. Yeah. What are your theories as to why this, like there are a lot of different things that I think this yeah. activated, but what is it that activated the ways in which it was jarring to people or, or why Israelis would have glommed onto this? What do you think are the key pieces of data about this that made people respond the way that they did? Because you're not the only Jew on TikTok. There are, no. there are rabbis with larger followings. There are a lot of people who have used the internet and different apps and different media to teach Dafyomi, but something about this activated a different kind of response. What do you think the variables are? Yeah, so firstly, I would like to make one important distinction that I always think of myself, and again, this is just my perspective. I know people externally view it differently. I am reacting to what I encounter. I am not approaching it as a way of teaching. I am sharing my authentic and real reactions. That's part of it. I will say from what I have read, the factors that really got people in that video were several fold, as you mentioned. One, I am a woman. Two, I'm blonde. Apparently that really mattered. I don't know why. Three, the fact that I was reacting in a 
very impassioned way that used profanity. And I do not retract that one <laughs> iota. And I was speaking about something that happened so very long ago, but had made me feel very viscerally anger and also pride. And in that conversation that I was encountering in that doff. And I also believe that having it done so briefly and in the way that I was doing it, that might have been a bit of it too. It was such a bite size. And that's the thing about viral content. If it's more than 30 seconds, you're screwed. That's really it. If you can get to 30 seconds, it's a miracle. Yeah. Um, but from what I saw, the feedback was, why is a woman doing this? Two, does she know what she's talking about? She appears to be blonde and she's wearing makeup and she has a red headband on. And three, oh my God, she's swearing. She has desecrated the entirety of Judaism. Uh, she's going to Gehenna now. Mm -hmm. And I think then people were very intrigued and wanted to find out what was in this video. And I also know that I have to give credit to the Israeli viewers because this may be an oversimplification. I'm sure it is. But they seem to have a real sense of humor about it <laughs> in a way that I really um, appreciated mm -hmm. that not necessarily has been echoed in the States. Yeah, I think the speed thing that you mentioned is a part of it. These are short videos. They're not super short, right? They're not like the nine second TikTok dance move videos, but they are short. I get the impression sometimes when I watch this, when I first watch your video, there's a little bit of like, wait, what the hell did I just see? Like, what just happened? Did that really, what? Like a discussion about Rav Chista. And I think that there's something jarring about the speed by which you kind of enter into this very different type of encounter with quote unquote traditional text and traditional ideas. And then it's over. And it's not prefaced by, here I am, a rabbi who's coming to teach you something. It's like, daf reactions. Here we go. And we're kind of in it and then immediately out of it. Yes. And in fact, that one was 90 seconds. I don't like to do ones over two minutes because I share them across platform and Twitter does not allow videos beyond two minutes. Mm -hmm. So I got to keep it short. Got it. And there's no time to preface by explaining anything other than I'm reacting to the doff. Now, I will say that video generated quite a few interested parties on TikTok who said, I'm not Jewish, but I'm riveted. I don't know what is happening, but I'd like to know more. The more puzzled they were, the more entertained they were. They truly had no idea what on earth I was talking about. And that was possibly part of the allure. Yeah. I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah. So David Svi, in your piece that you published in JTA about this, you said, quote, a new way of talking about Jewish texts and Holy Scripture has come of age with the internet, despite flying under the radar for many traditionalists. This forum communication about Torah is already fully developed, and it's time for it to be taken seriously as a genuinely new way of engaging with Jewish ideas. So maybe you could help describe what you think that is, because your observation is this is not simply one individual who's doing something interesting on TikTok. This actually represents a much larger shift in terms of how traditional texts are engaged with that needs to reshape how we think about Jewish traditional texts with the availability of this media. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of ways of approaching that. One is to tell the story of Jewish text in the 20th and 21st century as one about increasing and radical availability. There has been a huge amount of work put into making sure that as many Jewish texts as possible are available not just to people who have access to yeshivot and years of study and happen to be male and all that stuff, but can access it in any language that they can from anywhere that they can. And I think this is, um, it's not just that every religion has been doing this. I think Judaism in particular has spent quite a bit of time merging technological prowess and traditional Torah study such that it is now possible for literally anybody who has access to English to go online and, and access any part of the Talmud. And that has had a huge impact on the availability of these texts. It's not just of the internet, it happened before the internet as well, but it means that there has been a kind of radical decentralization of authority. And it's not, it's not just a story of the internet, right? Like every time there's a new technology that comes around, rabbis get worried that their authority is going to get lost and they're always right. And it happens anyway. So that's part of it. The other piece of it is that the internet is, I don't know, 30 years old, something like that. It's pretty new in the grand scheme of things. And because of that, I think a lot of the Torah content that we've seen on the internet so far is content that is still kind of an attempt to translate something that existed offline into something that can exist online. I think you see this, <laughs> I'm sorry to say it in a podcast, but you definitely see this in podcasts, right? People who were trained to teach in classrooms, adapting their content for an online platform. You see that in the length 
of the materials. You see that in like, you know, how are you, like, talk, oh, are you talking to me? <laughs> how did like a 40, 50 uh, minute show become a standard in the industry, right? Like there's a reason for that. Um, it's also the reason that like even today, like the top 10 Jewish podcasts are all either exclusively hosted by men or hosted by a man and a woman. So there's a reason for that. And I think what you're seeing right now is ways of speaking about Torah that really could not have existed offline. And that is very exciting. And I think like, I think it exists on TikTok, exists on Facebook and Twitter and other platforms as well. It is somewhat jarring to see that development, but there's a narrative here that I find really exciting to follow. So Miriam, I guess I'm curious because the way you framed this, and I'm suspicious of it, the way you framed it is all I'm doing is reacting to the DAF, right? It's just mm -hmm. there and I'm there reacting. And David Svi is suggesting actually something far more radical, which is the construction of a totally new way of conveying and teaching Torah. So I'm curious about like whether and how you see yourself as part of an intentional reshaping, not just of, hey, I'm just a person who's good at TikTok, who's being confronted by this stuff and then speaking it to the world, but I'm actually an active participant in the kind of reshaping of cultural literacy and Jewish knowledge through these media. I think that I may just be indicative of something that's already going on, as David Svi has mentioned. This is just the way I talk on a day-to-day -day basis. This is exactly it. The way I talk in the videos is the way I and everyone pretty much that I know actually speaks to each other. We don't use profanity as profanity. It's an exclamation. It is a uh, feeling. And I felt so very passionately about that doc that that's why it came out in the way that it did. But I think a great point that you made in your article, David Zvi, was about how this is not necessarily new. People have been thinking about Talmud in this way, making memes about it. There's many meme groups on social media devoted to Daf Yomi that I am a member of. I don't necessarily believe there's anything revolutionary in the idea of approaching it through meme millennial culture. That I feel I'm at home amongst peers just because I have not encountered the exact same thing on TikTok, and I indeed looked before I started this because I didn't want to be repeating somebody else's style or copying in any way. I was like, is anybody doing this? No? Great. But there's other forms of meme and millennial culture that have already plugged into this that I'm aware of and that I'm just a part of. Someone did suggest to me in a comment, oh, you're just doing this for the likes, you're raking in the likes. And I'm thinking to myself, yes, because we all know this is a tried and true method of getting famous, talking about Daf Yomi. <laughs> it's not. But I truly do believe that there is an audience. And I know that now because they've all reached out to me, every single one of them, hello, friends, um, to tell me, not only when they tell me they have criticisms, but when they say, this is exactly what I thought when I read that Daf, but I didn't want to say it because I didn't think it was okay to say, or I encountered this other doff, wait till you get to this one, I'd love to hear your thoughts in two years when we get to that tractate. People are already thinking this way. They may just not be voicing it in a public manner like I'm doing, mm -hmm. very, very, very upfront with my own face speaking these words. Another thing that I will note is the number of positive comments I've received from inside the issue vote. It's too late, friends. I'm already inside the yeshiva. I'm in their phones. That's the thing. They enjoy it because people of my generation, they do encounter communication this way and they experience it this way, even if within some of the settings that they're learning, they are not allowed to use that mode of communication. But they know it's authentic because it's their mode too. That's super interesting because when people who are inside the system of learning and knowledge see something like this, right, this kind of phenomenon, what they experience is we are the insiders, we are the curators and caretakers of this body of knowledge, and this person is kind of a gatekeeper on the outside, opening this out and sending it out into the world in ways that make us uncomfortable, right? The profanity is a piece of it, the democratization is a piece of it, but what you're suggesting is it actually moves in both directions. This is yeah. actually feeding the way in which knowledge is consumed inside the world of Talmud study. I'm curious whether it's beyond just yeshiva kids seeing this on TikTok, but also what consequences in the long run it has for how people engage with Talmud. I'd be curious for your take on that and David's fees as well. Yeah. One of the most powerful things about this whole experience, as an off the derech Jew myself, you know, I was raised Orthodox. I have put in my time. I really have. Like, it's been a 
a truly life journey for me with Judaism. And even though I'm not practicing now, these things are deeply, deeply ingrained in me to the point where it is so profoundly part of my identity that it feels almost weird to be described as an external person, even though I have intentionally placed myself outside of what I would term general orthodoxy because because of my experiences as being a woman in that world. Mm -hmm. That's what forced me out. And people are coming to me and saying, I've always wanted to learn Talmud, but I'm a woman. Or I've always wanted to learn, but I've been dissuaded for X, Y, Z reason. They didn't think I was appropriate for this. Now, my question is, why is anyone trying to gatekeep the heritage of all Jews? They can't make a decision about if they want to engage in mitzvot, if they want to live that life unless they're informed. So why would we be holding back information that could be profoundly impactful on how a person lives and engages with not only Judaism, but Jewish peoplehood? So I understand that it makes a lot of folks uncomfortable to think about something that they feel is absolutely sacred, discussed in this manner. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I don't believe that those feelings are more important than the people who have been historically disenfranchised from engaging with this content. I would just mention, for example, somebody who I dearly care for and who I study with is deaf. We're reading Checked at Megillah, and we got to the part about how deaf people can't read from the Megillah. That's literally spitting in the face of somebody who is trying to learn, trying to engage with the oral Torah, and they are then smacked with something like that that says, you are not good enough to be this and live this way, even if you want to. And I know, I'm not saying that everything that's in the Talmud is how we live now. Obviously, it is not. But that hurts. And people who don't understand the pain that certain people can experience while engaging in studying of these traditional texts do not understand why people would like me and my approach more than a perhaps quote-unquote traditional approach that doesn't acknowledge these realities. Uh, Miriam, a lot of what you say resonates. And one thing that I, I feel like I've been on TikTok forever. <laughs> and, and one thing that's that's been clear for a while now is that it is the least gate-kept platform for Jewish ideas that has ever existed even as like the number of people on the platform who are doing Jewish content is still relatively small. If you look for Torah content on TikTok, you will regularly see a lot more women, a lot more Jews of color, a lot more queer rabbis than you will see anywhere else. It feels like whenever I see people who are visibly Orthodox, like they're just doing dance trends, like they're not actually teaching Torah. Um, and I think like part of that is a kind of, once you open the floodgates, that's what appears. I think what you said about how this comes out of your Haruta makes a lot of sense to me because the other place where I have experience that method of talking about Torah is when I'm learning with a chavruta, I'm trying to puzzle out something that's really difficult. I like come across a new line and like I have my first reaction that doesn't have all the layers of censorship of like, this is how I'm supposed to talk about this. But it's like actually like what in the world is going on in this piece of Torah? And like it bothers me, it upsets me, it makes me happy in various ways. And that's that's really exciting to see. And this happens with like every time there's a new media, uh, you kind of like delve into these layers of experience that have always existed, but have never been recorded before. I feel like I see this in research inside the Cairo Geniza, where like, you don't just get like amazing documents. You also get literally kids learning how to write Hebrew and they're like writing Hebrew letters. And then they're also like scribbling little pictures of camels along the side or like doodling. You also get these stories that like don't fit a standard narrative of Jewish history. Like there's this one of the texts that I love to teach more than anything else is this Geniza letter where a person's like writing like, did you hear that like in my synagogue on Yom Kippur, these two men were making out in the back of the shul and then they had to call the police. And it's like, what, there is no story of Jewish history or of Torah that like I learned growing up in yeshiva that like explains that as being a piece of it. But it was there all the time. It's always been there. And it's just that now we have the ability to capture that experience in ways that we didn't before. I do wonder how much of what people think is appropriate versus not appropriate conversation throughout our history is just people censoring <laughs> everyone's real reactions in the moment. Be like, nope, 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 not a kosher reaction. We're not going to tell anybody you said that. And there wasn't any cameras at the time. So it was very difficult to record what somebody had said and keep that for posterity forever. But I think that's actually very, very interesting about the Geniza because it is a time capsule. You're seeing a moment in time and how people of that time interacted with this. 
And even within my own life, I see how generational conversations are shifted. You know, I, for example, I'm very close with my grandmother and she does not understand the way I communicate all the time. And that's okay. And sometimes I translate it back to her and then say, well, this is what I'm saying, but this is what I mean for her. And I understand that there's all types of ways of communicating about that. And not everything is for everybody. And I completely understand that. But to pretend that these are not the real thoughts that people are having when they encounter a doff would be disingenuous. Well, I think it's more than that. And I would give you more credit for this. When you taught the piece in the viral yeah. video about yeah. Rav Chista and Rav Chista's wife and the debate between two sages about whether or not she can wear makeup, what you granted to the learner was a humanizing of a set of male characters that is hard for two cis straight men chavrutas learning in a traditional Beit Midrash to access, to think about what is going on on a human level between those two people, what's the relationship with his wife, and where you really humanize is that Rav Chista's wife is hanging out in the story. She's actually a character in the story who is invisible in the context of a legal dispute unless you actually surface it and name it. It's not just how do I create these texts to be accessible to a new body of learner. It's actually how do I awaken certain aspects of these texts that have always been there, but for a whole variety of reasons that are related to both how it is transmitted and who is doing the transmitted, the text itself can't fully unfold in the way that it's supposed to. Well, I want to give credit to Rav Chista here, first of all, because when I first read the initial critique of his wife, my first words was, oh my God. And when I got to his response, the first words of his response are, oh my God. And I was like, oh, very little actually separates our response here. And if you look at what I actually say, the speech that I give in that video about even if your mother is standing at the edge of her grave, that is from his actual words. Mm -hmm. The only things I really added to that speech was the profanity and the words, you know, misogynistic and ageist. That was it. Yeah. Everything else, Rav Chista said. And that's what really made it like an immediate, ah, I know this so well. How dare a man speak about another man's wife. She's right there, dude. This is so incredibly rude. So everyone who's writing to me is saying, oh, you're so rude the way you speak about these great men. I'm like, no, no, he disrespected this lady, okay? Mm -hmm. She is just as worthy of respect as anybody else. And so Rev Chist is jumping to his wife's defense and I felt the same way. Yeah, it seems to me like there are kind of two crises that motivate mm -hmm. new types of learning online. One of them is a crisis of there's not enough Jews who study Torah and who find the pathway to realize that, like, as you indicated with your own story, my religious choices, one way or another, are about personal journeys and choices. But that doesn't make me closed off to access to this tradition as my heritage. It belongs to me. I own it. So right. how do we create more pathways and more openings for people to be able to articulate that heritage in ways that are good for them? That's good for the Jews. There's a totally different crisis that I think got surfaced in your presentation by the critics, which is mm -hmm. a crisis of what's going to happen to this heritage when it is allowed to be treated in this way. In other words, when it is allowed to be rendered in these terms. I wonder if you have any empathy towards that second piece, right, of like what is it that people are trying to protect? Because we're dancing here around sacred and profane, and I don't just mean profanity. I mean mm -hmm. that fear of... What happens when this is just taken out of our ability to cherish and protect something that we think actually requires a role of us? I think sometimes what I've noticed is a tendency to be more defensive about the Talmud than the Torah. And that may be about Christianity. I don't know. But it's true, which is ironic. But I understand the fear of losing something or having something you love be disgraced or insulted but I think that does not quite grasp what I truly feel about it or what people may discover about it. That fear says to me, we don't trust Jews enough to engage with this and not disrespect it, which is kind of a weird thing to say. We want people to engage with it, but not really, because then you might have opinions about it. And we don't want that to happen, because if your opinions don't agree with our opinions, we'd rather you wouldn't learn at all. We have to believe that this is strong enough to outlast someone's look at it and someone's critique of it to find within it the things that are holy 
And within the Talmud itself, it already contains the profound and the profane. It already contains things that I know people don't want me to talk about because they are hurtful, because they are things that we don't recognize as acceptable behavior in today's day and age. I understand that. And I do understand the importance of placing things in their historic context and not extrapolating outwards to Jews of the modern era, no matter what level of observance or a group they have affiliated with. But I do believe that we can trust that there is enough in here of profound substance and meaning that you can look it in the face, see what we would now think of as flaws in individual thinking amongst the sages. They're not right on everything all the time. That's just a fact, people. Mm -hmm. And say, there's still something here that's so great and so powerful, I'm going to learn it. Yeah. And my feeling is I feel for those people who are afraid, but I don't feel for them so much that I don't feel more for the people who are missing out because of their fear. David, see, I'm curious for your take on this because you made your case in defense of this. You made what I found striking as a kind of modern argument. This is a new form of discourse. This is where Torah is in the world. But you didn't quite go as far as what I think Miriam is suggesting, which is this is the old way of Torah, right? Shit posting predates well, the internet, right? <laughs> um, yeah, this is this is exactly right. I think looking at it and finding inside the reflection of what I'm doing now, if you look at it, it's there. Right. So Rav Chista's response to his interlocutor is its own form of shitposting. So I'm curious, like, how does that work in terms of your analysis of this? Is this merely an adjustment of modes of teaching a traditional text to a new mode of discourse? Or do you see this as kind of awakening some aspects of the discourse itself, even though those have maybe been suppressed by the primary custodians of this tradition for a long time, who are the traditionalists? It's probably a little bit of both. There's been a long a tradition of criticism. I think it is different now because people are actually quite angry with lack of representation, with perceptions of homophobia and misogyny. And that is bringing out responses to the tradition that maybe actually did not exist before. So I think it's a combination of the two. The other thing that I saw in a lot of the responses to Miriam to your videos is a kind of confusion between pedagogical content and kind of substantive content. People saying like, well, how do we think about this in terms of like the way one is supposed to talk about Torah if one is trying to get others interested in the topic versus how is one supposed to talk about Torah if one is like actually just trying to talk about it because like they're trying to think through the issues. And I think a confusion of those two different modes of discourse is I think becoming a big problem. And if one focuses exclusively on pedagogy to the exclusion of actually talking about substance, then I think what sometimes happens is like, you actually don't know what you think, you just know how you're supposed to talk about it. I think you see this, for example, quite a bit today in Jewish theology. There's like ways that people think they are supposed to talk about God, whereas if you actually ask any Jewish educator, what do you think about God? Like, what are your basic things? They may actually hesitate a little bit to tell you some things because there isn't actually a well-formulated mainstream Jewish theology today. It's actually like kind of fragmented, but that is hidden by the fact that we talk about it in pedagogical terms. So I think saying, you know what, this is not about pedagogy, it's about what do we actually think here is really important. And I think TikTok helps facilitate that because the people who view TikTok videos are so, so sensitive to the difference between what is this person actually trying to do and what is this person trying to make me think they're trying, like to what degree are they like trying to make me think something that is not true and to what degree are they actually being sincere? It's a platform that I think promotes and celebrates sincerity. And so that pedagogical mode, I think, is a lot weaker in the platform, and the substantive mode is a lot stronger. Right. I think that's right. I think if you, Miriam, had set out and said, I'm going to be a teacher of Talmud on TikTok, I don't think it would have worked quite the same way. There's something arresting about a human being studying Gemara and noting about how weird and hilarious it is. And the fact that there is some amount of moral instruction that emerges in some of the videos that I've watched, probably not every daf. But there are messages that you're conveying. Certainly the empathy with Rav Chista and Rav Chista's yeah. wife was a moral message that you were surfacing. But it just didn't feel like the heavy-handed, I think that's another way of saying the pedagogic choice, kind of I'm going to curate a message for some audience that's trying to cultivate in them something that's supposed to change them besides being kind of awed by how wacky and amazing the Talmud is. Yeah, I'm not setting out to influence anyone's thinking. I am merely out here to share my own 
authentic hot takes on this. But it has, and this has been a bit surprising to me, it has influenced people to tell me. I can't even count how many people have said, wow, I never thought I could do this. I'm really interested. You can do it. You're doing it. You have thoughts about this. And how many people say, how do you know this? Well, I'm doing the Daf Yomi and I'm studying it every day. That's how I know. Like there's work that goes into, and that's why I can't do a video every day. I have a job and I would love to do a Daf video per day. But uh, while I do offer my own personal takeaways at the end, for example, the most recent one I did two days ago is about we're at the point in the Moe Katan, we're talking a lot about mourning. And we're talking about how to not rip open someone's emotional stitches after something really traumatic, after the death of a parent. And having been through the death of a parent myself, that spoke to me very, very, very uh, deeply. And really, there's nothing really that has changed about the human experience of grief since that time to now. Our technology may have changed, but our emotions and relationship to that loss haven't. So sometimes I do include a personal takeaway about how I want to live in the world, but it's not like these are the laws that I want you to take away from this. These are the ideas I want to take away from this. And I agree that if I had set myself up as a teacher, that also would have been a bit disingenuous. I don't place myself in that role for several reasons. One is out of respect to the many, many women who have worked so hard and are still working hard to be accepted as Talmudic instructors. And I do not want to take anything away from that real difficult work that is still ongoing. Every time anyone asks me, I talk about how every morning I listen to Rabbi Michelle Farber's podcast on this issue because her insights inform me before then I go into Safaria and do the actual reading myself. And I encourage anybody who is listening to this and has watched my TikToks, if you are interested in Dafyomi, I'm delighted that you watch my videos. And on top of that, I would recommend if you're interested, check it out from somebody who is far more knowledgeable and invested than I, who does this as a real profession. Because I think there is space both for reactions that are somewhat entertaining and for that real learning. Mm -hmm. We've touched a little bit on gender throughout here, but it courses throughout Mm -hmm. the public reception of this. You alluded to at the beginning, people saw you a certain way. They responded to the color of your hair. They responded to the makeup as a piece of the story here. Um, So physicality is part of the story. I don't even know what my question is, but I'm stuck with Well, I just want to – I was going to make a point at the irony. The irony of them coming after me about that when in that video, I am literally going after somebody else for attacking a woman's makeup. I know. It's amazing. That many hundreds and hundreds of hundred years ago. You can't can't write this stuff. That's the irony. No. No, but there's something about the physicality that's so interesting because it's a two-dimensional medium. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So there's like something weird about like the response around embodiment. Yeah. And response about gender when, in fact, there's something so incredibly flattening about a media where this is possible. So I, I'm just curious if you or, or David Svi have thoughts about this. I think a lot of it for me, my initial reaction was, oh, okay, the big thing in orthodoxy, the one foot fault of orthodoxy is transgressing gender lines. You can do whatever you want. You can believe whatever you want. But the minute you transgress gender lines and suddenly something is not kosher, that was my initial response. But the more I thought about it, I said, no, there's actually a lot more going on here around the presentation of physicality as both a means of engaging the sacred and the profane. There's something weird here. I just can't, I can't totally disentangle about is, the videos themselves and the reaction that they're engendering. This has been the most perplexing thing to me about these responses. First of all, wearing makeup and an affinity for makeup is totally normal and totally normal within the context of TikTok, especially when so many videos are makeup tutorials. There's nothing weird about that. But the way it has been interpreted as being sexualized, when that is not actually why I'm wearing makeup, (laughs) and the fact that I'm blonde is not to entice you over here. It's not it. However, the feedback I've gotten and I've seen from both men and women, I should say, is not even talking to me, but actually about me. They're like, no, she's, this is from a woman. No, we can't learn from her. She's too pretty. Well, thanks. I thank you. Thank you, I guess. Like this is, it's not sneeze. It's not sneeze to learn from somebody who is this attractive. Firstly, what does Rabbi Yochanan say about that? Excuse me. Go apologize to him talking Mm -hmm. about disrespecting our sages. And from men, it's she's awful. She's destroying everything. But I want to fuck her. That is the sad reality of the messages that I receive. And I'll say that last Shabbat, I was so relieved because the Orthodox men had stopped saying that to me. 
And they picked it up again once Motzei Shabbat rolled around. But for Shabbat, I had a break. Like, guys, I am not interested in you. Not you guys. The world. That's (laughs) not why I'm doing this. It's not about me enticing you and being sexual in any kind of way and using my face to get you to study Talmud. Right. But it also speaks to diminishing women because of their appearance. You can't win. Either you're uh, hideous and no one wants to look at you, or, yep, nope, too pretty. We can't take anything you're saying seriously. Also, I would like to send a message back to my younger self who had very low self-esteem. There was a point in college when I would hide my Jewish star. I had very, very low self-esteem at that point. I didn't want people to think Jews were ugly like me. So now here at this age, when people are telling me, be less, do less, be less pretty because you can't be this Jewish and be pretty. That's rude. To say this to Jewish women is obscene. To have Jewish women to say it to me is even more a dagger in the heart than it is coming from men. Yeah, and it's worth also just acknowledging this is a secondary, maybe more minor point. But when this kind of thing happens, it ignores the fact that like a male rabbi with a beard is also embodied. Masculinity is a form of embodiment, right? Exactly. And so like to pretend the emergence of a blonde woman who's wearing makeup is suddenly physicalizing or gendering the exactly. encounter with another human being teaching Torah it ignores that any time a human being is teaching or presenting something to you, they are also embodied and they are also gendered. And that's the weird turnaround here of it surfaces something without providing for any sort of self-awareness about what yeah. exists in the world already. I think, David C., uh, you were mentioning this earlier, but it's a really good point that there are a lot of male Orthodox social media stars, but people who are very high profile and have huge follower counts. There's these two guys I follow and they do dance videos, but their tzitzit are out and like they're very openly, proudly Orthodox. And there's nothing wrong about this. But I have my doubts, although who knows, I may be wrong. And if I am wrong, I do apologize. That people are saying, stop, you're too attractive. Stop, stop embodying things. Mm -hmm. Be a nebulous voice. Actually, don't have a voice at all, but be just a nebulous entity with no gender and no human body. There's also something just so disingenuous about the idea that that Judaism, that Jewish culture is supposed to be literally blind, that it's supposed to be like about the letters and nothing else. There is like a pretty strong, pretty clear Orthodox Jewish aesthetic. If you go to Orthodox synagogues, like there was a type, there was like a thing called Gevir culture. There was like literally a magazine dedicated to what does Orthodox Jewish culture look like in America. So like these things already exist. And I think there is a kind of a front of having the look be different from what they expect, even beyond the gender piece of it. Mm-hmm. Last comment, last question for both of you is, um, I don't want to make you skip ahead, Miriam, but I do want to like study a little bit of Talmud together with you and get your live real-time daf reactions. Talmud says in Brachot 62a, this is like a meta text to this whole discussion. Everything I read, I was like, oh, this is the text that all of us are implicitly referencing. It was taught in a baraita, a rabbinic text that Rabbi Akiva said, I once entered the bathroom after my teacher, Rabbi Joshua, and I learned three things from watching him. I learned that one should not defecate while facing east and west, but rather while facing north and south. I learned that one should not uncover himself while standing, but sitting, in parentheses, I guess for modesty reasons, but we're not told. And I learned that one should not wipe with his right hand, but with his left. Ben Azai, student Rabbi Akiva, said to him, wow, that is so rude. You are so impertinent. Like, why would you follow your teacher into the bathroom and watch him going to the bathroom? And his answer is, famously, It is Torah. I it must is learn Torah, it. and I must <laughs> learn it, right? The more famous version of this comes later because the student goes into his teacher's bedroom. The under the bed and, situation. And listen, listens to his teacher having sex with his teacher's wife. And they're like, what are you doing there? And he says, this is Torah, and I will learn it. But the real shit posting text is this one. <laughs> of going yes. into the bathroom and watching it happen. So it just felt to me like the whole meta text to this whole thing is there's no version of talking about Torah that is rooted in really understanding the human condition than this one. Nothing you could do on TikTok could beat it. Thank you. Thank you for making my exact point when everyone's like, oh my God. And I'm like, have you read the Talmud, guys? Because it sounds like you haven't. Brachot, especially when we start the daf cycle, it starts with a bang, right? It really starts off, it gets into the demons, it gets into the bathrooms. It, it really has some hilarious and amazing things. 
But that is the part. It is Torah and I must learn. This is the thing I always come back to. This is the thing that so many people come back to when they're doing something in a slightly different way or they're doing something that other people frown upon. And they're like, well, no, I'm not going to the bathroom after you've gone to the bathroom to find out the way that you've wiped your butt. I'm not doing that, but I'm somehow going too far. I find this an inauthentic response. I Look, I love brachot because it is just so in your face with that content. And that's when I knew I was going to do this for the next seven and a half years. I was sure. After that, Doth, how could I not? Um, one thing that um, I feel like I keep detecting in the criticism is the question of, like, Torah is always going to be bathroom Torah now. Like, it's not going to be anything else. And I, sometimes I think, like, it's being set up as a kind of straw man. But mm. I think one thing that people miss is that the existence of this kind of Torah does not negate the continued existence and the importance of other kinds of Torah. Like, I, you know, I experienced this now with my kids trying to talk to them about swearing and like using potty language literally that like they're confused like how come we hear you guys or you hear like me and my wife swearing sometimes um, like why is it not okay for us to do that and the response and i'm sure i'll get mail that this is not the right response the response that like i give to them is like it is okay sometimes to use this language you have to learn the right way to use it because they're powerful words. They affect people differently. And there is different kind of registers of speech. And like part of what it means to grow up and live in society is learn the right register of speech for the right moment. But I think like gaining a new register of speech in Torah is an incredibly powerful thing. And I think it's something we should be excited about. Well, with that, I want to thank you all for listening to our show this week. And special thanks to our guests this week, Miriam Anzavin and our producer, David Svi Kalman. Identity Crisis is a product of the Shalom Hartman Institute. This week's episode was produced by David Svi and edited by Gareth Hobbs, with special thanks to Corey Choi, assistance from Miri Miller and Shalheva Schwartz, and music provided by So Called. Transcripts of our show are now available on our website, typically about a week after an episode airs. To find them and to learn more about the Shalom Hartman Institute, you can visit us online at shalomhartman.org. We're always looking for ideas for what we should cover in future episodes, so if you have a topic you'd like to hear about or you have comments on this episode, which I'm sure we'll be here, please write to us at identitycrisis at shalomhartman.org. You can also rate and review us on iTunes to help more people find the show. You can subscribe to our show wherever podcasts are available. We'll see you next week, and thanks for listening. <laughs>